Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. As we sit together this afternoon, we are going to take on the topic of sexual harassment, abuse, and assault. And it is, of course, a subject that has not only broken over the bow of our larger society, but it is certainly broken over the bow of the opera industry. And so many of you requested um, a focused session to understand sexual harassment in its definitions more deeply and to understand more fully how we can create respectful environments uh, for all of our employees, our contractors, our visitors, our board members, our volunteers, our staff members. There are so many dimensions in the opera field that need to be thoughtfully addressed. And Tim recommended that we contact Adrienne Davis, who is a member of the Board of Opera Theatre of St. Louis. Uh, she is a distinguished member of um, the, uh, the, uh, the William Van Cleve uh, Law School. Is it, you're, no, you're the, you're the William Van Cleve Professor of Law at Washington <laughs> University of St. Louis. Um, so this is a subject that within the educational sector, Adrian has dealt with extensively. And you can imagine how complex it is there with faculty and students and student housing. And every environment has its own complexity. Opera has a set of complexities as well that I've tried to explain a little bit to Adrian and that she'll be speaking about with us today. So without any further ado, please welcome Adrian and thank my colleagues here at the head table who've agreed to respond to the material as it unfolds with us this afternoon. Adrian. Well, it has finally happened. I am on stage at an opera event. <laughs> And all I have to say is those lights are really bright. <laughs> so I want to start um, by thanking Opera America and Mark Skorka for inviting me here to talk about an issue that is of importance, of course, to everybody, but I think is especially important in the performing arts and opera, which has a longstanding commitment to equity and inclusivity. Um, I also want to thank Tim and the team at Opera Theater uh, for including me in this. As, as Tim knows, 10 years ago, I proudly, I was a proud, someone who proudly proclaimed that I did not like opera. <laughs> Enter Tim O'Leary <laughs> and Opera Theater, and I think the third time that I saw two of the operas at Opera Theater, I said, okay, time to get season tickets. Um, and from there, it's been a wonderful, wonderful journey. So I want to say to the folks at Washington National Opera, you are in for a treat. <laughs> and I also want to say to the folks at Washington National Opera, thank you for gifting us back Andrew Jorgensen, who we are very excited, the big swaparoo. Um, and I really want to thank the audience. This is um, very challenging material uh, it's challenging for all of us, and I'm sure for many of you, it will trigger unpleasant and perhaps traumatic experiences. So please feel free to take care of yourselves however you need to take care of yourselves. And I just want to thank you for showing up however you, um, however you show up. So let's see if I can get this one to, uh, there we go. So unless you've been over, under a rock for the last year, <laughs> You know that we are in a brand new world um, with issues of sexual abuse, sexual assault, and sexual harassment being in the news in a way that they never have been before. And I think part of what, it's unsettling for a lot of reasons, but part of the reason that it's unsettling for a lot of us is that when we think about sexual abuse and sexual assault, what comes to mind is some guy we don't know jumping out from bushes or in a parking lot or something. And that's deeply disturbing. But what's even more disturbing is when it comes from someone we know, someone we trust, someone we work with, someone who's going to, who, someone who's frequently has been in our lives for many, many years and who we can expect to be in our lives for many years to come. And so when that assault or that harassment is accompanied by a breach of trust, it can actually be even more traumatic. So I'm gonna start with some very basic um, definitions and this doesn't, um, you guys don't have a, where's Gina? Where's my friend Gina? She's, 
Yeah, if you have one. Or a, an Oprah thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to start with some basic definitions. <coughs> So sexual assault. Sexual assault is a criminal act. It's unwanted, non-consensual sexual contact. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a pacer, so thank you all. So sexual assault is unwanted, non-consensual sexual contact. Every state has its own definition. Sometimes they require force, sometimes they don't. But again, this is a criminal act. In contrast, sexual harassment is not criminal. It can include criminal acts, but instead it's covered by regulatory laws, right? And sexual harassment, it can be one of two things or both. It's offensive remarks about a person's sex, right? So if I walk into my law school classroom and I just say all the men are dumb, or I start making jokes about you know, how dumb women are or how, how ugly men are, when I'm demeaning an entire sex or gender, that's going to be sexual harassment. And or unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, other ver verbal or physical harassment of a sexual nature. So let's plumb a little bit more into this second one. Now, how many of you have heard of quid pro quo? Yes, okay, great, so quid pro quo, Someone says to you, you just do this nice thing for me, and you know, you'll get that part, you'll get this job. Um, I, I won't tell people that you did this thing that you weren't supposed to do, right? In contrast is hostile environment, right? What's hostile environment? Okay, so an environment in which someone feels threatened or demeaned because of their sex. Um, unwelcome comments of a sexual nature that interfere with your ability to do your job. Anyone else want to take a crack at it? I think those two are good. It either has to be severe behavior, one-time severe behavior, or a pattern of contact, conduct. So it's not going to be an isolated one-off comment that someone makes. But if over time it becomes a pattern that begins to interfere with someone's ability or desire to do their job, but not just their ability to do their job, but their desire to do their job. Now here's what's really important, I think, for opera folks. This conduct, this hostile environment, this quid pro quo, it can come from a superior, someone who is, has authority over you, right? It can come from a coworker, including a peer or a subordinate. And importantly, it can come from a third party. Now, who might be some of these especially tricky third parties in the opera context? I saw a hand go up right there. Donors. Donors. Let's hear it for donors. <laughs> is someone who both is a donor, a small donor, and someone who, more, more importantly, works at a university that has lots and lots of big donors, countless times, right, that I'm out with donors, and they're just crossing lines right and left. And why is it really, really hard? Why is it really hard to just treat them the way you would treat a guy in a bar? <laughs> they, they, pay, they pay the bills, your job may be contingent on it. And even if your boss is really, really empathetic, you're basically drawing your boss into a very difficult situation. And what a lot of us decide is that even if we believe our boss will completely have our back, we don't want to spend our limited work capital on that, okay? A lot of people do. And increasingly, how many millennials are in the audience? Good, wonderful. How many millennials feel strongly about sexual harassment? Thank God for millennials. <laughs> Thank God for millennials. Because when, the me, when hashtag MeToo started, a lot of women of my age, women of a certain age, they thought, you know, we've been putting up with this stuff for 30 years. We didn't think we had a choice. You know, thank goodness for the millennials. So thank you all. Thank you all. Um, so it can come from third parties. This is really important because this had to be established early on by the Supreme Court. The sex and the gender of the person who, in law, we would call it the complainant and the respondent, right? The perpetrator, the victim, it doesn't matter. And sexual orientation doesn't matter. 
right? Women can harass men, women can harass women. Men can harass women. Gender non-conforming people can harass people who conform whose gender conforms, right? Early on, not this won't surprise you, early on, people tried to, tried to use as defenses the fact that they were straight. So men who were accused of harassing other men said, well, I can't be a harasser, I wasn't harassing him, I'm, I'm straight, I'm not gay. Supreme Court said, doesn't matter, your sexual orientation doesn't matter. It can come up as something to look at, but it doesn't matter. So the gender piece of it, anyone can harass anybody. So, raise your, now, uh, so the other half of us who aren't the millennials, <laughs> <coughs> let me ask this, how many millennials know who this is? Okay, wow. uh, uh, fewer, fewer, <laughs> fewer. Of the non-millennials, how many of you know who this is? Right, okay, so <coughs> here, here's the history of sexual harassment. It's a brief history. <coughs> So, until 1986, sexual harassment was not illegal. I mean, some states recognized it, but as a general matter, it wasn't illegal, meaning you couldn't sue for it, and you couldn't make people stop under the law. You might be able to get people to stop in other ways, but it was not illegal under the law. 1986, the Supreme Court decided a very important case that said, hey, guess what? Sexual harassment is sex discrimination, and it is illegal. It started out in the workplace, and it quickly migrated to schools as well, right? So these are just very common institutions in which um, sexual harassment is considered sex discrimination. That was 1986. It didn't really get a lot of legs until 1991, when Justice Clarence Thomas was having his confirmation hearings, and someone who we'd never heard of before, Nita Hill, someone who had worked for him for several years, came forward and said, guess what? He sexually harassed me. And even though obviously he was confirmed onto the Supreme Court, it sparked discussion and dialogue that completely transformed workplace culture, ultimately school culture. Anybody disagree with that? I'm not saying it got rid of it, but all of a sudden people were talking about things. Um, so in the future then, when my colleagues would sexually harass me, then they'd say things like, oh, I guess I shouldn't have done that. Uh, <laughs> this is like Hill Thomas. I was like, yeah. It is like that. Glad you got that. <laughs> so, here's a complicated set of figures. Very different. Um, what do they all have in common? Apart from the fact that they've all been accused of some kind of sexual assault, sexual harassment, um, sexual abuse. What do they all have in common when we look at them? Yes. Power. power. Right? They all have power. They all have power. And this is one of the things I think that's so challenging for us to figure out because in a lot of ways, power can be built into sex in ways that are kind of, can, can be kind of sexy, right? And that's been going on for a long time. That can rapidly become creepy, abusive, and illegal and traumatizing as well. Right? And you can sort of go through and think about all the ways in which these, all these men had different kinds of power in, uh, in different kinds of ways. Now I want to dissect that a little bit more. So how would we define power, right? So I would define it as economic, cultural, or social capital that enables someone to compel others to do things they don't want to do. Does that sound fairly straightforward? Not terribly controversial? Now, power can be explicit or implicit, and this is where I think it gets really tricky, right? So going back to the quid pro quo, someone can say to you, hey, I'm your boss, you have to have sex with me, right? Um, or, hey, I'm your tenured colleague, you know, if you, wanna, if you wanna get that article published, you're gonna need to go out on a date with me. But where it gets a little trickier is when the person has power and isn't aware of it or isn't explicitly requiring things that the other person feels that they're caught in a power situation. And this is, I think, one of the best definitions of power and how it plays out in the context of sexual harassment. The person with power is frequently able to rely on institutions to protect them and take their side over the side of the victim. Does that, does that resonate with people, right? Yes, okay. So that's the person who says, well, Harvey Weinstein, of course, is the clear example of that. 
he had the force behind him of not only um, his company, Merrimack, which as we all know, is, you know many of us you know, lauded it as one of the, the beginning in many ways of the, the, the wonderful independent uh, film movement that began in the 80s and 90s. Um, he had Hollywood behind him. What else did he have behind him really critically, crucially? He had money and power. He had the press behind him, right? So a lot of those women said, I tried to go to the police. I tried, in one case, the police called the DA, and the police said, hey, we think there's been a sexual assault here. The DA in New York said, not prosecuting it, not touching that one, not gonna lose my career, because I know who has the power, right? And the New York Times infamously squelched it. So power is when you're able to rely on the institutions to take your side and take care of you. Now, that doesn't mean that those institutions won't go down with you, right, as the Weinstein Company did, right? But that's a big piece of what power is. And frequently, people aren't even aware when they have this kind of power, right? I remember sitting once in a, um, it wasn't about sexual harassment, it was about something else, but I was sitting once in a, a dean's office with an older woman colleague and several male colleagues, and she was upset with me about something. And I said, I said, well, you know, Janie, you know, why can't we work this out? Why did you bring in like these three really senior guys who are all deans? And, and she said, well, they're, I, they're just my friends. You know, and she was, I believe her, she was completely unaware. She didn't see that I was like 27 and they were all in their 50s and had been teaching for 30 years. She really didn't see the immense power discrepancy. So of course, what did I say in that context? I said, whatever you guys want, whatever you guys need, you know, whatever, it's your way, right? Because you all have all the power and in this context, I don't have any. Now this is really important too. Having power doesn't make you a bad person, right? Because so often people want to say, <laughs> Tim O'Leary, powerful man in opera, good guy. <laughs> His wife, one of my dearest friends, right? Good guy. So frequently people want to say, well, I'm a good person, that means I don't have power. No, no, right? That's not the same, that's not the same thing at all, right? It's really important for people to, begin to be able to own their power in order to understand how their actions may be received by other people. Okay, um, so I don't know how closely you all followed the Me Too movement unfold, right? At first it was Rose McGowan and a few other women, many of whom had been sort of marginalized within Hollywood, um, coming forward and speaking, but do people remember when Gwyneth Paltrow and jo Angelina Jolie went public in the New York Times? Why was that a game change? Power, power, because all of a sudden, it wasn't these, quote, as people said, fringe actresses who were bitter because they had been sidelined because of their own lack of talent and they were blaming Harvey Weinstein or they were trying to get a payday. Instead, it was women who, um, who had nothing to gain, women with industry power. Anybody know who these women are? These are all of the accusers of Bill Cosby who agreed um, to sit for an interview with uh, New York Magazine. Why is this also an image about power or lack of power? Collective power. What happened when the first woman came out and spoke against Bill Cosby? Second one. Third one. Fourth one. In the end, it was about 67 women, and a lot of people still believe they are all lying. It's an elaborate conspiracy of these women who don't even know each other, right? The point being, that to really make it clear that in order to combat the power that sometimes harassers, abusers, rapists have, it takes immense power because how many of us are Gwyneth Paltrow or Angelina Jolie, or how many of us would be able to identify 66 other people who experience what we experience? And even just trying to make your inquiries can make things really difficult for yourself. Just a little bit about consent, because this is a tricky one. So consent, Sorry, consent is agreeing to sexual activity with another person or people, right? That's pretty straightforward, right? I also want to say here, this is important to say, I think, especially in this context, because a lot of people say that I'm anti-BDSM or bondage domination sexual masochism, and I'm, I'm not anti that at all, right? <laughs> but they, I'm not. <laughs> I, you know? Um, so, but that community also has its own complicated norms about consent, right? And that's really, really important to understand. So here's where it gets a little trickier. So consent has to be freely given and not coerced. 
Now, why does this get tricky? And if you don't want to think about it in the context of opera, you can think about it in the context of a university, you can imagine. Right? Why does it get tricky? Yes? Being impaired? Being impaired, what if you're too drunk to consent, right? And it's, it's a, I think, gosh, what is it now? It's probably about 25% of um, college women will be sexually assaulted at some point in college. It pretty much holds, holds true across all universities and all, all, um, all residential universities, not, not community colleges, but all residential universities, it's pretty much the same. Overwhelmingly, it all happens within those first 40 days on campus. We call it the red zone, the first 40 days. We're always like, every year, we're gonna get them through the red zone. Why? They're learning to drink, right? I mean, a lot of them, you know, they may have sne been sneaking drinks. College, drinking, here I come. They don't know their own bodies, they don't know their own boundaries. They're outside of their social networks. They're away from their families for the first time. All of these things combine into a, um, a perfect storm, right? So part of the trick, though, with being impaired is frequently, by definition, you don't know you're impaired, right? Um, even though a lot of people will say, oh, I just want to drink until I black out, but they don't actually notice the moment when they cross the line, right? But if the other person you're with doesn't know you, they don't necessarily know whether you still have consent or whether you still have capacity or not, right? If I've just met someone or I've never been drunk with them before and I think, well, you know, he's walking around, it all seems fine to me, right? So this is one big, really big issue is with impairment. Anybody from like culture of alcohol and opera companies? I hear rumors, I don't know, I hear rumors, and obviously not coerced. And the not coerced is also really important here because what can look like coercion to one person and not like, look like coercion to the other person? Can I get an example? Something that one person may experience as a course of context, the other person doesn't even realize that the other person feels co coerced. Yes, in the back. So power, back to power imbalance, absolutely. Back to the power imbalance. And also it can be, it can be context. Right? So sometimes, you know, people end up in someone else's hotel room or they end up in a place that's off site and they don't have a ride back and maybe their cell phone is dead so they can't call Uber and they're feeling trapped and the other person doesn't even realize that they're feeling trapped. Now, consent can come from words, it can also come from conduct. Anybody watch Lifetime TV? Probably not this crowd so much. <laughs> If you, if you did watch it, you probably wouldn't feel like you could admit it. Um, but <laughs> sometimes, you do, Jesus. <laughs> sometimes, when I'm writing an article, I've got a little Lifetime TV on in the background. It's just interesting enough to keep me at my computer, but not so you know, riveting. You know, it's not like watching you know, uh, Citizen Kane or something like that. Um, but if you, sometimes, just watch Lifetime movies. And every time you see something, that today we would call a sexual assault, lack of consent, just pause it, right? And you'll, you will see, you will see how your, comp your perspective completely changes. So words are conduct. Person must not be incapacitated. And increasingly now, um, people are calling for affirmative consent. And in fact, California has passed a law that says that every college in California has to have an affirmative consent definition of consent and sexual assault. Anybody know what affirmative consent is? It is so unfamiliar, I think, to those of us who are not millennials. What is it? Absolutely. So for my generation, it was no means no. For this generation, it's yes means yes. Right? And this is really counterintuitive to a lot of us, because for a lot of us, once someone says yes, it's like I can keep going until they say no. Right? seems reasonable to people you know, over 40 like myself, but a lot of millennials are saying, no, you should really seek consent at each stage of the encounter. Now, how do you make consent sexy? I can come back next year and talk about that. <laughs> I do not have time <coughs> to go through that. <coughs> I should, I, I, I do have to tell you all this. I was teaching this to my, my students once uh, about consent I was trying to explain to them why this was so foreign to so many of us, and they just didn't understand. And I said, I said, you know, one day, a lot of you all are gonna be married, and you're gonna have like 10 minutes, and you're not gonna be able to like go through all these steps. And they were like, what do you mean? And I, and I, and I, and I but, but 
then they booed me off the stage practically when I said to them, I said, also, you're going to have sober sex. And they were like, no, <laughs> never. I, I said, really? And it's going to be okay. You're not going to be able to get blitz drunk every time you want to have sex with your spouse. So like, that wacky Professor Davis. Um, so, I, I thought I would also slip in here a little bit about microaggressions. Anybody? Microaggressions? I see you nodding. You want to take a stab at it? Ah, so what's offensive about that? Okay, well, <laughs> starting with that. <laughs> right, 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 right. It's an assumption that's being made. Okay, so I'm going to define microaggressions as questions, insults, or acts, right? Question or statement. You must love tacos. An effort to bond with you, perhaps. I love tacos. You must love them, too that are often unintentional. Most of the people probably are not trying to insult you, right? They're, frequently they're probably trying to create a bond with you they're try, or trying to admire what they think your culture is. Individually, each of these statements is not a big deal, right? Every single time someone says it, it's not a big deal. But over the course of years and years and years, they begin to take an emotional and psychological toll and sometimes, they can spark a reaction <laughs> that will seem out of all proportion to the person who innocently said, you must love tacos. And if she says, you know, not that you would say, if she says, you're just a racist, the person would think, oh my gosh, it's like a plate of a reaction. And they don't know that they're the 10,000th person who told her that she must love tacos. And we have an, ex any other examples people have in addition to the tacos? Yes. And just not taking the time to see, wow, it's right in the email, right? You could just look and, you know. And also kind of not respecting you enough to think you're someone whose name should be spelled correctly. Okay. Other examples? Yes. Okay, <laughs> there we go, and there, and there we have it. I was telling the panel earlier that um, I was out last year with uh, a donor, and um, and it was just very. It, it, I, I was out, and he said, he said, "Oh, you look lovely," and I said, "Thank you," because it was he intended as a compliment. So I was complimented. I said, "Thank you," and then um, we saw some other women at the event, and every woman we saw, said, "Oh, you look beautiful. Your smile is so gorgeous." And when I was sitting across him with another woman, he said, oh, the, vi the visual of you, too. So over the course of the evening, I heard him say the same thing to 100 different women. So my thing, and of course, he, every time he said it, he intended it as a compliment. But after the third one, I was like, this is meaningless. You know, it's completely meaningless. And all that's happening is that every time you see someone who has a specific sex, you're reducing her to someone who's going to somehow feel complimented because you tell her that she's pretty, rather than saying, you know, oh, you know, I, I, I love that comment you made the other day, or hey, we should talk more about some politics. So again, he was intending to be complimentary, um, but it, over time, again, it can kind of be perceived as microaggression. By the time I got home, I was, I had a rictus. <laughs> yeah. So, so why is sexual harassment bad? Um, <laughs> I just was checking my time. Um, so, so why is it bad? And I'm going to speed up a little bit here. Um, anybody know who this is? Again, you need to be way over millennial to get this one. How many people know who this is? Helen Gurley Brown, publisher, editor of Cosmopolitan. So, smack dab in the middle of the um, Hill Thomas hearing, I want to read to you what Helen Gurley Brown, the publisher, founder of Cosmopolitan, maybe not the founder, but the publisher and editor of Cosmopolitan magazine, a, just a, a tremendous woman with tremendous resources and power in the respect of the publishing industry. This is what she published in the um, Wall Street Journal in 1991 in the middle of the Hill Thomas hearings. She said, she talked about the wisp being wistful for the, um, here we go. When I was working my way through secretarial school in Los Angeles at the radio station, and I came in from school every afternoon, some of the men would be playing a dandy game called Scuttle. 
rule. All announcers and engineers who weren't busy would select a secretary, chase her down the halls, through the music library, and back to the announcing booth, catch her, and take her panties off. <laughs> Once the panties were off, the girl could put them back on again. Nothing wicked ever happened. <laughs> Depantying, she made it a verb, <laughs> Depantying was the sole object of the game. While all this was going on, the girl herself usually shrieked, screamed, flailed, blushed, threatened, and pretended to faint. But to my knowledge, no scuttler was ever reported to the front office. Au contraire, the girls wore their prettiest panties to work. And then she goes on and talks a little bit more. Alas, I was never scuttled. Sometimes I would look up hopefully from my typewriter to see three or four scuttlers skulking in the doorway, mulling it over. But the decision was always the same, too young, too pale, too flat-chested, clearly unscuttleable. I think indeed we should come down hard on the bullies and the creeps, but not go stamping out sexual chemistry at work. Let me find this troubling. <laughs> <laughs> deeply, deeply creepy, illegal, assault. This would be an example of something that's both a criminal act and sexual harassment. So there you get both of these things, right? But here we have a leading feminist who claimed to be about women's sexual empowerment, calling for the rules not to clamp down too hard on sexual chemistry in the workplace, right? So why is it bad? So there's obviously the legal liability. It's illegal, right? But why is it illegal? There's the business case, right? It generates a lot of costs, a lot of disruption, right? So I'm sure many of you knew, saw that the, um, all the money in the world had to be suddenly refilmed to take out. Kevin Spacey didn't have to be, but that's what Ridley Scott decided to do. And some of you may have also followed the fact that the Boston Museum closed Nicholas Nixon's photography show early at his request, but it cost them a lot of money. Sorry, these all came up together. Um, so competition, right? How many of the opera companies want to compete for the best talent? I, every hand should go up on this. It's not a trick question. Yeah, everyone, I think. No, we want the worst talent. Um, so it should strike us that people don't want to go work in places that are known for being abusive, disrespectful, um, and possibly you know, assaultive. There's the cost of attrition, the cost of losing people in whom you've invested a lot of money. You know, at our university, if we hire a top uh, engineer or physicist, that can be a $750,000 investment. If that person leaves three years later because someone sexually harassed them, that is bad not only for our reputation and our moral values, but also for our bottom line. Another reason why sexual harassment is bad is that good sex, not meaning moralized sex, but just good, healthy, fun sex, should include incense, consent. And also, people shouldn't be barred from achieving their life goals by sexual coercion or hostile environments. And finally, sexual harassment reinforces social hierarchy. Goodbye, Helen Burley Black. <laughs> <laughs> so, what are some of the um, what are some of the things that that make this particularly tricky in creative contexts, right? Well, some of the things that are required among creative people, and here I mean not only opera folks, but the the arts more broadly, literary culture universities, schools, right, the, all the creatives, it requires the freedom to think and to create. You have to be able to think outside of the box, and in fact, breaking free from social constraints can be the hallmark, obviously, of great artists. It also requires a lot of camaraderie, right? You have to build teams, you have to build teams really, really quickly, and joking and relaxing and making fun of people, bonding very quickly. These are all ways of generating camaraderie, which is essential to good teams. A lot of the arts have very work hard, play hard cultures, right? We can spend a lot of time isolated or really focusing in ways that are, um, that are very, very stressful, focusing on your voice or me focusing on my writing. And when I'm done, I really, really want to relax, right? And then consent can get very complicated. We can talk, we've talked about that, we can talk about that more. So when you think about opera, you can raise your hand if any of these sound familiar to you. Not that you've personally experienced them, but if they sound familiar. So the repertoire, right? Are there any operas out there that are misogynist? <laughs> abusive women? Make light of abuse against women? 
Anyone seen that? Just raise your hand. Just raise your hand. Okay. All right. So the repertoire itself, and unless we're going to discard the repertoire, which I don't think we can do or should do, the repertoire itself is challenging. Action stage left, right? Directors have a lot of autonomy, and, and their vision is very, very important. And a lot of this is how people physically interact with each other, right? I'm not going to tell my students that they've got to like kind of sort of be on top of each other or touch each other here. That would be completely inappropriate. But that is the business in opera, and that can make things awkward, and they can make things um, challenging, and sometimes when people cross lines or when it's not done in ways that are thoughtful and sensitive, it can also end up amounting to harassment. Getting naked. So rumor has it you all sometimes have to undress with each other. You all don't all get your own individual dressing rooms? Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, also, I was just talking to Barsha, and she was saying another thing that happens is just the act of getting fitting, fitted for, um, for, for, uh, for outfits, for costumes, right? Your body is part of the job in a way that it's not for a lot of other professions. Again, the camaraderie itself is essential to the team. The 1099 problem. A lot of the folks who come in and out of opera companies are not actually employees, meaning that you can't control them in the same way. They may come in for three weeks, completely disrupt your opera company, and then they're gone, right? 1099, that's the word for contract workers. The boarding house, right? Where do a lot of people stay? In the homes of donors and, uh, and board members and other people in the, in the community, right? And we assume that these are all good people, but it shouldn't surprise us that they're not all good people or that people misread signals. There are stars in opera, so I hear. And stars can have a lot of power over people who are vulnerable. We've also talked about donors and how donors can have power over people who are vulnerable. You're on the road, right? You're not with your friends. You're not with your family. You're maybe you're away from your sweetie, right? People get very lonely, and that can create lots and lots of dynamics, including my new favorite term, the showmance. <laughs> right? The showmance. Now, showmance is frequently are very consensual. They're a lot of fun, and you know nothing bad happens afterwards. And frequently, showmances sometimes end up in what? Marriages, exactly. And so sometimes when we're talking about harassment, people turn immediately to the couple and they say, but it all ends up great for them, which can make it really, really challenging to try to figure out how to deal with it in the culture. Um, why is it so hard? You know, with the things that they use in corporate America, the military command and control, don't do that. It doesn't work in creative culture, right? It just doesn't work. Mandatory training. This is something that a lot of people call for. The studies out of Harvard show it's actually counterproductive. Um, voluntary training is great, but mandatory training can be counterproductive. No one wants to be constantly policing other people's behavior. Who signs up for that? Says, yeah, I want to be the person at the party saying, stop it. <laughs> Trying to police behavior activates bias and rebellion. People want to do things just because you tell them they can't. It can create cultures of resistance. You also have volunteer cultures, which again is very different from corporate culture. You have a lot of people who are there out of the goodness of their heart or their passion for the art. And finally, operas have more limited resources than do corporations. The corporations can say, if I was the CEO of, of Google or Facebook, I could just give Sheryl Sandberg, I could say, here, here's $100 million, fix it. <laughs> Tim O'Leary, not so much, no. Here's $50, <laughs> <laughs> get some bagels, <laughs> go easy on the cream cheese, and bring me back the change. So what do we do? Um, so contractual approaches, right? This was early days, and we still do this. Sometimes we have people sign things as a condition of their employment. <coughs> Love contracts, right? So if you start dating someone, you have to disclose it. And these can be very effective. The challenge is that frequently the employees and the members of the company feel like it's just about mitigating risk. It's not about actually caring about the problem. Title IX officers and coordinators. This is something that, that studies show actually does have a lot of, it has a very positive impact if you can afford it. Having someone who's designated or who is um, in charge of, someone who's accountable for, who's charged with, empowered to really focus on this issue can be very, uh, very effective. And training. Again, you have to be thoughtful about how you enroll it. We can talk about that more in Q&A. And here are some emerging disruptions to the practice. Having multiple points of reporting instead of a single authority figure. 
right? Multiple people who were empowered so people could find their way to the person with whom they feel most comfortable and also so that many people in the company end up feeling accountable and responsible for, for the culture. Peer-led training. So instead of having someone like me kind of drop in, well, I like to think I'm kind of a fellow traveler and author, right? But, um, but peer-led training, having people talk to each other about these things. This has been incredibly effective in the LGBTQ arena where um, people train each other, people train their peers, and it's much more received than when it's done by, quote, experts. It can really lead to cultural shifts. And finally, bystander intervention. One of the things we found in universities is that 72% of students who responded said, hey, I saw something that I thought might be a sexual, a sexual assault or something that was unwanted sexual behavior, and I didn't intervene. 72%, right? Why didn't I intervene? Because I didn't know how. Training people to identify things and learn how to effectively intervene and not by going up and saying, Mark, stop harassing Adrian, right? That's not gonna work, right? But other things like, hey, Mark, let's go get a beer. I wanna talk to you about something, right? We have to create new cultures and we could talk about that.